Hey, what's up, everyone? It's Ron from the Boxing One Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode. On today's episode, we have Vec Jacob from CBC Sports and Complex Canada to discuss the Raptors' recent run of good form. If you're enjoying our content, make sure you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and hit the little bell for notifications whenever we put out anything new. Also, make sure you follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Boxing One Pod and leave us any comments on what you feel about our episodes. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hey, what's up, Box in One World? Thank you for joining us for another episode. Uh, as always, I'm joined by uh, Azam Faruqi and Pramit Bose. And uh, today, we're actually happy to be joined by uh, Vivek Jacob, uh, who's a writer for CBC, CBC Sports, uh, Complex Canada, uh, also the host of uh, the Red Couch Manx podcast, and uh, North Courts, I believe, is seen as well on, on YouTube. Is that right? That is correct. Thanks for that intro. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, so I, I, I want to get started by uh, discussing what we've been seeing lately from the Raptors. And uh, if, if nothing else, uh, the recent run of form is kind of a reminder not to overreact to a team that goes two and eight after being displaced by a global pandemic and uh, and also loses two pretty important front court pieces. Um, so if you can just get into, you know, what, what have you seen differently from the team? What is it that um, has shifted from that two and eight start to where we are now? Yeah, I think the first point you made is really important, right? Like when all the teams are showing up for training camp, they could just get right into it. Let's get into our sets. Let's figure everything out and get into action. But for the Raptors, they were still trying to figure out where they were going to live, how long, you know, wh whether or not they were going to be in Tampa for the whole season, all that type of stuff. And so I think it took a, a little while. I think there was a bit of a lag in terms of actually uh, getting their basketball together. And, and then the new faces as well, right? Like you have Mark and Serge leave and you have uh, guys who are trying to make a new impression on the team. And so I think for Nick Nurse to figure out uh, exactly what the rotation was going to look like, uh, that, that was the biggest challenge for him. And I think when you look at the difference between that two and eight start and what we've seen over the last 31 where they've gone 14 and seven, you've seen those pieces come together where you're seeing Utah Watanabe contribute. You had Stanley Johnson for a while make uh, a difference as well. And and then I think it, it comes down to the core just playing better as well, right? Pascal Siakam, he started out pretty much the way we saw him in the bubble and that was a concern, right? It was like, is this guy lost forever? But um, he's turned it around. I think he's playing at an even higher level than he was uh, at the start of last season just because of the way his playmaking has improved uh, and and so i think all those things coming together are why we see the raptors now in fifth place in the east and hopefully continuing to surge so is this as simple as uh, just pascal playing better and then they're getting the sets like players getting used to the system nurses in place or there's a little bit more to it uh i mean in terms of the sets, you, you know, you have to factor in, obviously, Chris Finch is gone now. So he was coming in to bring in some new sets to the offense, bring in some cutting. And so how that was going to factor in uh, just the comfort level with the defensive schemes as well, I think is big. We're seeing a lot of defensive improvement of late. And I think the one thing that's challenging about the Raptors defensive schemes is the fact that, you know, they're not like a Milwaukee Bucks that's heavily reliant on one strategy and saying, this is what we're going to do for 48 minutes for 72 games. And, and, you know, that's all you have to focus on with Nick Nurse. You're going to play a lot of zone, different types of zones. You're going to go, you know, two, three, you're going to go box and one, you're going to go triangle and two, you're going to go man to man. And so, that demands a lot out of chemistry and understanding and communication. And so when you have a lot of new players, that was pretty much non-existent early on in the season. And so that is starting to come together. And then offensively uh, as well, right? Guys knowing where they're supposed to be, where they can expect passes. Like a lot of the times we saw Kyle Lowry in a pick and roll action. He's dumping the ball off. Aaron Baines isn't ready for the pass. Uh, and so different situations like that where players are now more prepared, uh, for when the shot is coming their way, uh, things like that, uh, I think, have made a big difference. And I, I know I was I was looking at the numbers because I was I was really trying to figure out you know what has really changed, especially over the last four games. Um, 
you know, what, what were the changes numbers wise that I was able to see uh, in, in their play? And I, I really thought, you know, offensively, I, I was going to see a, a big, a big jump in, uh, in efficiency and, you know, maybe, maybe the pace a little bit slower. Cause I, I think the, the games are a little bit lower scoring than, you know, what, what we are used to in the NBA now, but I, what really jumped out at me was, was the, the, the defensive improvement. I, I think they were sitting over like, you know, their, their, their often their defensive rating was about uh, just over a hundred, I think. Uh, and if you look at what they were able to do to Embiid um, and, and Giannis, uh, like their, their true shooting effective field goal percentage, uh, their offensive ratings like took massive hits uh, over the games that that they've played against the Raptors, and it's kind of you know same old what, what we're used to over the past couple of years with with the Nurse defenses, where you know they they can really contain those types of players, and we've seen it you know even 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 early on you know with some of the struggles that we we're seeing, they, they were still able to contain some of the better players. Yeah, I think you know you mentioned uh, Giannis and Embiid, but I would throw Chris Middleton in there as well, right? You look at him in the two games that the Raptors played, uh, he had. 11 turnovers he had a combined nine field goals over those two games and so the Raptors really harp on an individual player's weaknesses and especially with Drew Holiday out of the lineup they were like hey we're gonna gang up on Chris Middleton we know he struggles against ball pressure and we'll see what he does with it and he really struggled with it there is sort of that swagger Nick Nurse ha does have a little bit of that arrogance where he'll say hey this is something that we can target with this player and we're gonna do it and we're gonna push them into uh, an area of discomfort and we'll see if they can snap out of it right like he, he doesn't care how janky it's going to be we saw the boxing one in the finals against <laughs> Steph Curry so uh he'll, he'll go to any limits uh, to uh, stop who he feels is the key and so I think now knowing who he can trust uh, to execute those schemes uh, and let's not ignore the fact that they have gone small now I think that has been a major boost as well. Just having the core in the starting lineup that, that allows you to get off to better starts and it plays to their strengths because they want to scramble, you know, they want to collapse in the paint and they want to scramble out. And then the length that, you know, you look at Pascal Siakam and OG Ananobi, what they're able to do with their length. You look at Fred, Fred Beverly constantly being able to poke balls out uh, of opponents' hands. And then you look at Norman Powell, he might only be 6'4", but his wingspan is seven feet. And so, uh, He's not a great individual defender, but I think behind those three guys where he's able to just anticipate passes uh, that are coming in and then just get out in transition, all those things uh, are why they're able to put the pressure that they're putting right now on the opponent. It's team defense, not in the, like they really stretch. It's and Stanley Johnson in one of his post game um, scrums was talking about it. It's like, they were he was being praised um i can't remember who it was about his work guarding luca and he kept reiterating well it's only because the other four guys were precisely where they needed to be yeah so i was able to do my job but if one person is out of position it, it collapses the whole house of cards yeah when you when you look at the raptors early on you know one of the things you that was clearly noticeable was the fact that that last rotation was always missing right like they, they could play 20 seconds of really good defense and then all of a sudden that one extra pass and it's a wide open three or it's a dunk and it, and that was the thing that the raptors were doing the last couple of years and you're saying where is that gone or you know the the other difference i notice now is i actually find it a good thing uh, for the Raptors when fans are complaining about those flyby contests because it means the Raptors are actually executing their schemes. If you look early on, no one was really complaining about the flyby contests because there were no flyby contests. They weren't even making that rotation. And so now we're seeing more of that. We're seeing them get out to the perimeter uh, and challenge these shots. Should they be doing it all the time? I, I, I don't think so. I think teams the really good teams have caught on to that and they're just taking that you know they're just faking it and taking that side step three uh but at the end of the day you know the improvements that they've made are significant so i don't see nick nurse changing it anytime soon and wh what you mentioned about that that last that last contest the last rotation that we weren't seeing early on i think that's really one of the things that led to yuda watanabe getting getting minutes uh early on because he was all over the place, running around like his hair was on fire, just 
just contesting everything. And sometimes, like you know, we've we've seen it with Chris Boucher in the past, where you know he'll he'll almost do it to a fault, where it puts it puts other guys in in bad positions, and you know it kind of collapses the defense a little bit. But early on, like Yuta was do Yuta was doing what we absolutely needed somebody to do because it just looked like it wasn't there. And you know, it it could have been the fact that you know they were displaced, and you know people people's minds are probably elsewhere on their families. And uh, but but that's why I loved what Yuta was doing, and we 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 needed it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's organized chaos, right? That's what the Raptors bring defensively. And Fred Van Vliet noted early on in the season that the last couple of seasons, they've almost been an autopilot because they know where everyone's going to be. They can anticipate the, the other person's next move so they know where to go themselves. And so I don't think any of that was there early on in the season. Uh, and now, you know, over time, we're seeing that all come together. It took some time. Uh, you expect that to be the case with, some new faces and again all the adjustments that they had to make uh, logistically but you know at the end of the day they've got it together now and mm -hmm. it's going to make for uh, an interesting second half of the season well, for sure to that point on yuda and what happened to him on friday let's just keep he had the guts to go in, um, and try to contest it baines had his back turned and just sort of standing there like a pylon almost and <laughs> yuda actually took on the challenge so He's been getting roasted the past few days for, but I was like, hey, most guys wouldn't even try. He went up there and yeah. tried stuff. Yeah, I mean, that, that that's a trait of all shot blockers, right? Every, everyone gets dunked on, and that just means that you're constantly trying to contest. You're constantly trying to protect the rim. And so I think for the players, the coaching staff, they will look at it and say, hey, that's a guy that's you know going to put his body on the line for the team and do whatever it takes. He's not worry about his ego or anything like that, right? To me, I'd be more concerned by the guy that sees someone just coming through the lane and just getting out the way. Mm -hmm. That's the guy I don't want on my team. So uh, I'll take Utah, you know, risking it all uh, in that fashion all the time. Yeah, definitely. And and you you touched on it earlier with uh you know with with the going going small and that's that's made a big difference. And you know, early on I think uh, us for sure and maybe a lot of fans in general, uh we're we're really getting frustrated with with Nick Nick Nurse and, and sticking with with Aaron Baines and and you know Alex Len when he was around um, was that you know was that one of those things that they had to do to see how Aaron Baines would fit in with with the rest of the guys and so that Nick Nurse could get an idea for you know how his rotations are going to play out once once things settle down yeah for sure i think you know one thing that maybe gets underrated with uh you know rotations and things like that is just the relationships that need to be maintained right this is an nba 2k where you can just plug a guy in plug a guy out and no one's really saying anything you know once in a while you get a notification saying hey someone's requesting yeah. a meeting <laughs> <laughs> you know in this case you have to manage that relationship and so if you've had conversations say with an aaron baines uh when you're trying to sign him as a free agent and saying hey we see you as a starting center we want this we want this and you know we're going to give you all of this uh, then you've got to give him the opportunity to at least show that he can be that. Now, once you've built up en enough of a sample size where you can say, hey, Aaron, we've given you a chance. We tried to, you know, give you as much leeway as we can, but we're running out of time here. We've got to get the season back on track. Uh, then that conversation becomes that much easier, right? And so, uh, you know, not, not to say the egos would be bruised either way, but I think coming down the line when you need someone, you know, that that might be part of why we're seeing the production we're seeing out of Baines right now as a backup center in a role that he's probably more comfortable in. There are these people called agents who are very, very powerful. I think you, I don't know. If you've read, uh, I don't know if you've read Victory Machine yet, uh, about the Warriors, and yeah, just talking about the power they really expose some of the power agents have and. If you ever wonder why a team signs a player for no reason, I mean, the, the most open example is Contavious um, Caldwell Pope, uh, Rich Paul guy signing with the Lakers to help set up the LeBron signing. But you'll always, if you ever wonder why teams take chances on guys that you just wonder that they don't fit in the rotation, we have depth here, why? It's likely setting up a different move. So there's always, <laughs> there's always, there's a method to the madness, even if, most fans or even the media doesn't see it there is there is you have to remember that the coaches are operating with more information than we are 
trust the Messiah. At the end of the day, if you can't trust the Messiah, then you can't trust in anyone. Well, so. that's a good segue <laughs> to our next question. <laughs> well, I, actually, before that, I, I want to touch on a point there, Pram, because so who who is linked to Baines that we're bringing in next year then? Oh, who knows? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we we got to do some digging. We got to check that out. We got to. It may not be next year. It could be in two years. Who knows? Who knows? No, but, but ask, ask your question. Well, uh, that was ob- obviously that's the next sort of. I guess there's two names right now: Masai and Kyle, sort of the staples of the run, the the two core pieces of the run since 2013, since the Rudy Gay trade. Really, those have been the two guys. Those are. Kyle was the last player that was on the roster when uh, Colangelo was the GM. So uh, we'll start with Masai. I mean, there's still obviously, he hasn't extended, at least not that we know of. Everybody else in Nurse, Bobby, I'm assuming the others in uh, front office um, staff have been all been extended. As Masai said, yeah, we're going to take care of everybody else first. What do you think is going to happen there? If you were to, I mean, there's all that Washington rumor came out again about a month ago, sort of died down again. I mean, most elite orgs, you talk about the Lakers, Nets, the Warriors, San Antonio. I mean, they all have their front offices lined up. So, what? Where do you think? What do you? Th- what do you think? I, I honestly think Masai is going to be back. Uh, I would be surprised if it was a long-term deal. I think he's more likely to take a couple of years and just, you know, kick the can a bit further down the road and see where things are at in a couple of years. I don't think he would want to leave uh, the Raptors sort of in limbo where you've got this off season where you don't know what's going to happen with Kyle. You've got potentially, you know, in excess of 20 million in cap space that you don't know how you're going to operate it. So I think he'll prefer to leave the organization in a better spot than what it might potentially be in the summer of 2021. And, you know, looking beyond that, I I just think he's thinking a lot bigger than just basketball. And Mm -hmm. so I wouldn't be surprised if he left the Raptors. It it wasn't for, you know, another president job uh, in the NBA. It was, you know, to really take, you know, the Giants of Africa or everything that he's doing to promote basketball there and human rights uh, to another level. And so, uh, you know, the contacts and yeah. the, the time that he can put into that. I think that's what he would transition to. And in the meantime, I will say, I wouldn't be surprised if the main negotiating factor right now is to actually get more money so that he can create more funding to do those other things. Yeah. Um, and that's where the whole Washington rumor is comes into play because of that, that access to Capitol Hill. Although, I, don't, I mean... Hey, because Obama's based out of Washington now. A lot of organizations are based out of there. I'm not worried about that. He's got BBM. He's, he doesn't have to worry about actually being there. <laughs> is, is he still on uh, BBM? There are benefits of being in person. You know, <laughs> technology, obviously, especially now COVID-wise. And oh I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. There was that old. There was that commercial when he first came back, right? With the Raptors, uh, he was using his BlackBerry or something. Mm-hmm. There was yeah. a commercial about it when this was 2013, so... Still, enough people used the BlackBerry at that time where the commercial, there was some kind of relevance to it. But I think one thing we learned is that, uh, I mean, COVID, I mean, we've proven that anything can be done virtually. But I remember reading about Durant. One of the reasons he went to Golden State wasn't just simply um, the team, but it was that he wanted to be situated in the Valley. Yeah. I mean, it's, no, that's it's, true. Yeah, it's and it's all speculation. Same thing so, with like yeah. LeBron as well, right? It's it's beyond just basketball. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, ho- ho- let's let's just hope that he that he stays. I remember when so we had Blake Murphy on and, and we brought it up. Blake Blake was just he was just shaking his head. He's like uh, he's like, of course Washington is going to want him, but like who who wouldn't? So uh, let let's let's hope we can retain him. But then so the, the other part of Prime's question was was Kyle. Uh, and we discussed this um, just in relation to um, the Andre Drummond, you know, kind of rumors that was out there by by Shams about you know the the talks that we're having. And I got some questions about uh, some pe- some people from some people who listened to our show uh, asking like why we would just 
not consider trading Kyle for Drummond. And I don't want to talk to like talk about this in the context of Drummond because I, I think Drummond is is not the answer. He's not going to do much for us. But you know, would they consider a Kyle move at this point for anybody else? Or like, we, have we? Is this going to be the last season that Kyle's going to be around in a Raptors uniform? I guess. I mean. I think the only way Kyle gets traded if he want, is if he asks for a trade. I don't think there's any way the organization is actively pursuing it. Uh, I, I think it would take Kyle to actually go to the front office and say he'd like to move on. And if I'm being perfectly honest, I can't see a trade out there uh, that changes the Raptors' ceiling dramatically. Uh, those players that you would get for Kyle Lowry to do that w- would not be available. And what so... Thing also is that you look at the contending. So if a team were to trade for him, it'd have to be a contender. And if yep. you look at the contending teams who really would could use a Lowry to like really just increase their odds, most of them have depleted their asset base. I mean, like the Lakers depleted a lot for AD. Um, Clippers uh, with Paul George. Like a lot of these teams have used up their draft pick slash young player pools. So I, I'm not saying no. I mean, there's always a move to be made that we just don't see. And yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I could see it going either way, but it, I don't think it's as simple as, okay, it's time to move on from him because, or it's it's the right time. They're ready to go to like that next core he's getting older he wants to win oh and nobody knows i mean there's something to be said about at his point in his career just he could stay in toronto decline and will continuously get love he could go elsewhere decline and just take the blame and the abuse so because <laughs> uh, like it's really about what you do for that team today um yeah how LeBron got blamed for the the first year with the Lakers. He's no Kobe, whatever. So, yeah, no, for sure. I, I mean, I think if there is a team out there that can get a deal done that would actually appeal to Toronto, it would be Philadelphia. I mean, and that wouldn't be a win now move. That would be for the future. So, you know, you give up Kyle Lowry, you get a future player in, you know, Tyrese Maxey, you get a first round pick, probably have to get Danny Green back to match salaries. Something along those lines, uh, I could see the Raptors doing if Kyle Lowry wanted to go that way. Because then, you know, he would look at that situation and say, okay, him next to Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid, you know, that that's going to be tough to beat. So, uh, yeah, that, I think that's probably the only team. And then obviously the hometown factor as well. <laughs> you know, I think, I think that would mean a lot to him. I don't even think this could work. But if. No, actually, the more I think about it, it won't work. The only other team I'm thinking that's a, now a legit contender, but they're covered in the backcourt, was but was Utah, but their backcourt is pretty much set, so there's no room for them. Yeah, Conley and Mitchell are playing great together. Yeah, they're, yeah. I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, as soon as I came out of my mouth, I was like, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, and, and also, so like, just to to take this a little bit further, so obviously they're not the the two and eight team that that we saw. Um, they're far better than that. Um, are are they closer though to to the two and eight team, or are they closer overall to what we're seeing now? Like this, the ceiling is pretty high right now. You know, four and zero, they they have wins against two wins against the Bucks, a win against the Sixers. We'll see what happens uh, tonight in about an hour against the the Sixers again. But um, where where on the spectrum are they? Are they closer to to the really bad team, or are they closer to the really good team that we're seeing right now? And also, what do they do going forward? Do you think they just stick with what they have, or do they make minor moves? to kind of round out the roster for the playoffs this year? So, I mean, I do I do think this is a really good team. I think one thing I'll say is coming into the season, so before the 2-8 and eight and all that, I saw them as a team that was likely to be a first-round exit that would maybe, depending on the matchup, have a shot at the second round. And now I would, I would say, you know, uh, unless they get a really bad matchup, I would expect them to get to the second round. And that's kind of where I saw them last year. And, you know, obviously last year they looked like a team that, you know, pre-COVID could get to the finals. And, you know, who knows, that that seven-game series with Boston could have gone either way. But I honestly, I'll put it this way. When I think about that team that we saw against Boston 
and how bad Pascal Siakam was and how bad Marco Saul was. I think this team uh, could be better in the playoffs than that team was. Really? Yeah, I mean, one. That's interesting. Uh, no, I, I think. Can you they, expand on that? Yeah, because I mean, the on paper, that other team you had a surge and Gasol surge played well in that series. Obviously, we saw how terrible Pascal and Gasol were, but and the center situation definitely still needs to be looked at. I would say. Yeah. So I so I think when when I say that, I mean. Look at the way they were able to perform uh, in that series. Like, Marcus All was a shadow of himself. Serge Ibaka could give you something offensively, but he was still hurting you defensively. Um, you look at Fred Van Vliet's numbers in that Boston series, like, they were way down from the Nets series. Like, he, he looked like an all star in that Nets series. He looked like an all star in those uh, eight games, uh, you know, those seeding games. Uh, yeah before the playoffs got started. And then, you know, he, he completely vanished in that playoff series. So uh, it was heavily reliant on Kyle Lowry. And the offense to me was really a mess because uh, everyone had them, well, at least the Celtics had them figured out in the sense that everything was either co coming at the rim or it was a, a three-pointer that they were jacking up. And so when I say that they can, this version of the team can be better than that version, uh, I look at Pascal and Fred as being the keys to that because Pascal's playmaking has elevated. And so uh, I feel like he's going to be able to create better looks for his teammates. He's going to be reading those double teams a lot better. Uh, Fred Van Vliet, his ability to shoot the mid-range shot. I think when we saw those playoffs and when we saw Fred Van Vliet for the majority of last season, once he was taken off the three-point line, teams kind of just hung out in the paint saying, we know you're not going to take the mid range. So we'll hang out here and we'll be ready to block your shot or we'll wait for the kick out. And now he's pulling up and he's taking that mid range, which is forcing the big now to make a decision. It's like, Oh, I can't drop the way I was used to. So he's having to get up a bit further. Now that's giving Fred Van Vliet an opportunity to drive past him. And that's, what's creating chaos. And so I think the shot spectrum for the Raptors is a lot better offensively. Defensively, they're coming together. And then, you know, trade deadline, I don't I don't expect a major move, uh, but I do expect them to be players in the buyout market. Obviously, it'll be tough to contend with the Lakers and the Clippers and uh, the Nets who will be looking to get their own big man uh, as insurance for DeAndre Jordan. But uh, I, I do think that, you know, the version that we saw specifically in that Celtics team, uh, this Raptors team as it exists. I mean, let, let's not forget about uh, the improvements that OG has made as well, mm -hmm. right? Uh, like that's going to be a big factor, the fact that he's going to be able to contribute more offensively. Uh, Norman Powell, he'll be the X factor like always is. If, if he can bring this consistency, consistency to the playoffs, then for sure. I do think that uh, the level of play of this team can be higher than the level of play we saw in that Celtic series. And, and, oh, that's and, a very good point. Yeah, go ahead, Ron. Since you mentioned his his you know unfortunate departure, uh, you know Chris Finch going going to the Wolves, and you know kind of kind of odd timing. I don't think there's a there's a lot of precedent for for this happening mid season. But uh, how how much of it? How much of what we've seen offensively and, and some of the changes that we've seen has have seen have been his influence on on the offense in general. I think cutting is a big thing. And I think maybe just that expectation to take the best look you have. And I think, you know, if anyone's read Nick Nurse's book, uh, Rapture, you'll see that he's someone that is a big believer in, uh, you know, the shot spectrum of taking threes and taking uh, shots at the rim and getting to the free throw line. He's not big on the mid range shot, but I think that's something that's, sort of been you know he's been pushed to do this season you know just because you don't have Kawhi and you don't have uh you know a, a, you know a LeBron James who can pull up in the mid-range it doesn't mean you just don't take mid-range shots right because for me when, when you just tell the opponent that that's all you're going to try to do it makes you that much easier to defend yeah, exactly. right what, what happens to the Rockets every year in the playoffs yeah like, yeah the, and 20 hardened years it's just they you can get away with it, and again, in the regular season against weaker teams in the playoffs. But once you come, 
like once you're facing the elite teams, it's a, you need to be able to surprise them. Yeah, you yeah, got to I mean, be a defense honest there, right? Exactly. And the, that's the other thing too, right? Why is the Raptors defense so successful? Because they're constantly changing. Because they're constantly giving you different looks. Why do the Milwaukee Bucks fall apart in the playoffs? Because they do the same thing over and over, right? When when you constantly do the same things, teams can plan for that. Teams know what to expect and the teams can execute against it. So when you add that element of variability where, where you add that dynamism to your offense, I think it makes it that much more difficult to defend. And so that's why, again, you know, I, I do think uh, the Raptors are looking like, you know, those lessons from before that they've had to learn. Again, you know, Chris Finch deserves a lot of credit for that. And then the cutting again, you know, before I think you'd only see cutting where it was, you know, almost forced, right? Where Pascal Siakam gets the ball in the post or someone gets the ball in the post. And now you're saying, okay, the ball is stuck there. So someone has to move. But now you're seeing, you know, even just on a pick and roll, you're seeing uh, as soon as they come off the screen, someone from the strong corner is cutting right through and they're able to get a dunk or, you know, you're just seeing a lot more movement. And so I would credit Chris French for that for sure. Yeah. And and, and with the cutting, I, like just to further expand on that point, I, th- I think, you know, in the, in the past, like it was, it was just really like, there was no believability to the cut. It was just, let, let's just come through. This is what I'm supposed to do. They, it, like nobody was trying to sell that they were going to get the ball at any point. And, and now with cutting, especially when you, when you add a guy, like we've seen lately, uh, a guy like DeAndre Bembry, who's, you know, Rondé Hollis Jefferson sort of, but you know, he's, he's, he can, he can make plays a little bit more. He can handle the ball. And adding that extra facet to the offense really helps because he sees the game a lot better than than maybe somebody else who would have been in his position. And and just in general, the you know at, at bringing OG back is 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 completely changing anything because now you're so versatile and, and Nick Nurse can go back to really being fluid and 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 changing what he's doing offensively, defensively to match the situation. Whereas before it was kind of just like this is what we got, this is what we got to go with, and it's you know square peg round hole. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, the final part of that I'd add is Norman Powell, right? Like him getting more minutes. What are his strengths? They're cutting, they're slashing, they're attacking closeouts. And so when you put him around players like Kyle Lowry and Fred Van Vliet and Pascal Siakam, where he is the third, fourth option in the offense and he can attack off of what all those other guys are doing, it makes him that much more effective, right? When we say starter norm versus bench norm, like there is more pressure on him when he's coming off the bench because now he's being asked to create, he's asking, he's being asked to do more around lesser players. And so when you get him around that starting five, it just makes life that much easier for him. And, yeah, and, and to, to cap this discussion off then, uh, is, is there any concern that we're going to see what we saw last, last, uh, the last postseason against, against the Celtics where the offense just just completely dried up. Like that's the big concern that I have. And Pramit and I were talking about this. Uh, like, you know, especially with with the way our offense is constructed right now, it's it's a lot of drive and kick. Uh, and if we're not hitting shots, I, you know, I'm I'm a little bit concerned about seeing a repeat of the Boston series again. Yeah, I mean, I would expect if the Raptors get the Celtics again, that is just a bad matchup. For them, yeah. right? Uh, obviously, Marcus Smart isn't healthy right now, but if he's healthy, you know, that team's outlook is completely different. Kemba Walker looks a shadow of himself. And so uh, that would be a bad matchup for sure. But again, you know, I would have concerns about, you know, what Pascal Siakam are we going to see in the playoffs? And so if he reverts back to the player that we saw in the bubble, then obviously, it, you know, what I said earlier about, oh, that team, you know, this team can be better than that one, that goes out the window. Right. If he, he if he plays at this level that we're seeing, then it changes the outlook completely. And so, uh, yeah, I think those are perfectly valid concerns to have. Even with Fred Van Vliet, you know, we, we've seen him struggle uh, against teams with a lot of length before, even on the championship run. Yeah, he had those great uh, series to close out against the Bucks and the Warriors, but he could barely get a shot off against Philly. Right. So I think those are things, again, he's going to prove have to prove. Uh, in the postseason, because when he was going up against the Celtics and Marcus Smart is bigger than him and Jalen Brown is bigger than him and Jason Tatum is bigger than him, it just makes life really difficult. Yeah, um, I really believe like last year's Celtics series had Pascal just been average 
<laughs> won that series. Like, I agree. I think a lot of the problem was that he was so bad, it just threw their offense just completely got distorted and discombobulated and yeah. It, I mean, they were miss. He missed a lot of like open looks at the rim, a lot of floaters, um, and it just threw everything else off. Because at the time, he's when your leading scorer is throwing stuff is just out of whack. It just really disrupts the whole rhythm of the offense. I mean, the, he, the defense was incredible in that series. He but, was very Baines esque at the rim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, you know, that's one thing that I think Pascal still needs to develop that sort of forcefulness when he's getting to the basket i think he's still too cute where he's almost too focused on what the defender is trying to do and so if there's a hand up he will try to switch where he's finishing from and you know sort of change his angle and change his body motion where i think he's just got to go up with conviction and say hey either i'm gonna hit or i'm you know gonna dunk it on your head and so uh, I think a bit more of that will help. I think a bit more of that will help, help him get to the free throw line as well. And then, you know, uh, I think Fred Van Vliet's playmaking, we've talked a lot about, you know, him being able to get his shot off, but his playmaking has gotten better too, right? The the pick and roll reads that he made last year versus this year, it's night and day. And so that improvement in itself is going to help. And we'll see, you know, we, we talk about the guys who did struggle uh, in the postseason last year and whether they'll change this year. We have to see the guys who haven't seen the postseason at all, really, if they can even handle it, right? Like someone like Chris Boucher, what's he going to look like in a postseason with big minutes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's that's a good point. That's that's one thing that yeah, I, I hadn't even thought of because uh, Boucher's, you know, it, it's looking like he's he's going to play a big role and he's he's been massive for us up until this point. I, I like I expected him to take a, a step up. I didn't think like when I look at some of the some of the analytics, like he he just he he steps out. He just stands out in a lot of areas, and I, I was not expecting that. Uh, happy that we got it, and it's looking like you know he he might be in line for for another little bit of a bump uh, when when his contract's up again. Um, but I mean, I, I think that this is this is a good place to end off the the Raptors uh, the Raptors conversation. I mean, uh, I, I think we're all in agreement that a second round uh, appearance is is definitely possible, and, and hopefully it's a little bit more than that. But um, uh, Azam, did, did you have any uh, any tennis or, or soccer questions that you wanted to ask? <laughs> well, soccer I'm hurting these days, so I can't. Uh, but... Liverpool fan. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> but. Sort of a disappointing Australian Open for the Canadians. Uh, they didn't like. We saw a little bit of a you know, like U.S. Open last year. Obviously, Bianca wasn't there, but the men's they made it past the first week. What what, what happened this time around? Like, I think for me, you know, Felix he should have closed out that match against Karatsev. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, you're up two sets to love. There's no reason he should have lost that match. That's going to be a big learning lesson for him. Um, but I thought he he was impressive against Chapo himself, right? Mm-hmm. To pull off a straight sets win. I thought that was solid. Chapo didn't play great, but, you know, Felix took care of business. I, and so I think Felix will look back and think that, you know, he definitely should have been the one playing against uh, Djokovic in the semis because Dimitrov had an injury in the quarterfinals and that helped Karata there, right? Mm-hmm. So... I, th- I think Felix should be looking back and saying, I should have been in the semis. Um, Bianca, I didn't have much of an expectation for her just because she was playing after so long. After 15 months, I think it would have been unreasonable to expect her to sure. you know, get to the semis or the finals or anything like that. Right now, I'm just hoping you know she can play for more than two weeks in a row. Um, and then, yeah, beyond that, Milos... You know, I, I think it's always going to be tough for him at this stage of his career. Uh, he's probably hit his peak, um, and so if he if he can make a run uh, deep, it's probably going to be um, at the Australian Open or the U.S. Open. The US. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, definitely not at the French. He's not running around all <laughs> over, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we so, kind of know him as like a fourth round quarterfinals. At, at best guy right at best yeah but but i think now you're seeing again the the youth come up right and so mm-hmm. that that's going to make it that much harder like last year when he made it uh deeper uh, and lost he beat he pulled off that surprise win over Sitsipas, right mm-hmm. i don't think anyone saw that coming 
And so uh, that's where that, that's one thing that should be an advantage for him at the Australian Open, where it's the first main event of the year. And so that's when his body should be the healthiest. Mm -hmm. But again, he picked up he picked up the ankle injury against Djokovic, right? Like going in, we, we didn't even know if Djokovic was going to play that match. Yeah, yeah. Until a couple of hours before the match, we didn't know. And so it, it was disappointing in that sense that Roundage couldn't put up a bigger fight. But then at the end of the day, there's a reason Novak is 11-0 against him. It's amazing, right? Like another Australian Open. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a Novak fan, and when I saw the Fritz match, I I thought the tournament was done for him. I like the, not the like not that he wasn't going to play again, but I just didn't think there was any way he could win. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, I was very surprised uh, that he got out of this Varev match. I think that again, you know, comes down to that maybe a little bit of that mental block that some of the young guys still have, and. You think about Zverev, like third set, he was up 4-1, loses mm -hmm. the set. Fourth set, he was up 3-love, loses the set. So those are things where the young guys still have some work to do to catch up. But I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the old guard holding them off as long as they can. So resisting. There's no one inside who can... I mean, there's a yeah. lot of good young players, but... I mean, French, you're going in, you're probably still thinking Nadal, right? So it's gotta Yeah, be. exactly. It's got to be Nadal. Uh, Djokovic will be the favorite at Wimbledon. U.S. Open is the one that always looks like the wild card every year, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. I think that's where, you know, by the end of the calendar year, the, you know, there's a bit more uh, mileage on the legs and injuries play more of a factor and fitness plays more of a factor. And so I think that becomes a bit more of a wild card. And hopefully we can, I, I don't know what it's looking like, but hopefully we'll have some fans uh, in, in New York for the, for the U.S. Open. I don't know if they've said anything yeah. about that yet, but. Hey, you think Roger's got one more in him? I'm hoping I want one more. I would love to see that. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no. I, I'd be surprised if Roger has any left in him. I thought, you know, it was impressive enough for him to get from 17 to 20, right? I, I think for a while at 17, we thought he was done. <laughs> and then he was able to come back and get three more. So uh, I thought that was impressive to at least extend his hold at the top. But I, I would be shocked if Rafa doesn't have the most grand slams uh, in men's tennis by the end of the French Open. Mm -hmm. No. And, I mean, I, th I think the only shot Roger has is at Wimbledon. And even now, I mean, the surface has changed somewhat over the last little while. It's no longer that traditional serve and volley. So, I mean, you still have longer rallies. Kind of plays against him. But, uh, yeah, I think that's probably his only shot. I'm with you there. I... I, I you know, watching that match where he played Djokovic in the final, you know, I, I think Federer was the better player mm -hmm. in, in the final. It's just obviously, you know, Novak won in the way that mattered. And I think that's the one thing that Novak has where all of a sudden when the, you know, the pressure is on him and, the you know, the situation gets difficult, he just goes into this mode where it's like, I'm not going to make a mistake. Yep. You're, you're going to have to do something world. absolutely ridiculous, <laughs> but I'm not going to make a mistake. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think that was Roger's chance. And so if, if you're Roger, you have to take heart in that, right? Mm -hmm. If you're Roger, you have to look at that and say, I was a better player. I can still play at that level and, you know, give himself every chance he can for, for Wimbledon. We talk about LeBron and Brady playing at a high level into their late 30s, now 40 for Brady, but Roger is in that category. He's going to be 40 this year, and he's... This doesn't ha Like, I don't know a lot about tennis, but I know enough to know that this does not happen for somebody to be at his level in his late 30s. Yeah, I mean, before Roger, Rafa, and uh, Novak, no one really won in their 30s, right? Like, you know, you would say Sam Jim Connors... Won his last at 31. And then yeah, exactly, like, right? And so, like, Jimmy Connors was kind of an exception. Mm -hmm. I think Agassi might have won one as well uh, yeah. into his 30s, but that's that was really about it. You, you, and But I think that, again, goes back to you have to credit sports science, right? And now there's so many things you can do diet-wise, fitness-wise, fit, training-wise uh, to keep yourself going for a longer period. And, you know, they do treat their bodies like machines, right? And, you know, gone are the days where, you know, they're smoking – 
right before a match and just showing up and <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean? Like those days are long gone. And so the fitness levels are just crazy now. So um, I think this will become more of the norm where you're able to see the greats go on till, you know, their late thirties. And, you know, if, if, if we're having this conversation, you know, we have to include Serena in there. I know she has yeah, one yeah. Yeah. of late, but you know, the, she's the one with 23. So uh, at the and end of the day, she's with, not... when she was pregnant. Exactly. Right. So uh, Olympia can say she's got a Olympia can say she's got a grand, a grand slam title of her own. <laughs> <laughs> so la last last question, just to just to cap cap this off. And again, we appreciate uh, you joining us and spending so much time with us. But uh, so Man United. Uh, yeah. Second place. Um, I don't I don't know if you expected that much success uh, coming off a rough season last last year. But um, how? It, it's got to be hard still, though, looking up at first place and seeing Man City above you guys. Uh, yeah, it is. It is hard. But at the same time, you know, I would I would much, much rather see Man City than Liverpool up there. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it just no. And I say it more from uh, the standpoint of just total titles. Right. Like it's it's going to take a long time for City to get up to United's 20 to get up to Liverpool's 19. So. Uh, I, I think I'd much rather see City get a few while United are still trying to find that level. Um, when Liverpool win one, it really hurts, right? Because they're right there with United. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think for United, you know, I uh, this is probably the most encouraged I've been post Alex Ferguson. So, uh, I think you know they've maintained some consistency for the first time. I, I've I've really been pro uh, keeping Ole. Uh, since he's arrived because I just wanted some stability at the club. I was tired of just getting rid of manager after manager after manager. It, you know, that, that hasn't been United's way. That's been Chelsea's way. So uh, for me, you know, I prefer to have that longevity. I, I prefer to have a manager who can actually build something. And so even with the criticism Ole was getting early on, United struggled early on, got knocked out of the Champions League and everything like that. But, you know, you see the value of just sort of showing that you have faith in someone yeah and i i would say i mean i, I was a little surprised i'm surprised to see them at this, like i was hoping that they'll probably end up like top four just in terms of progression not hoping in terms of like winning because obviously that's right. no no for me but <laughs> fernandez has been a like bruno has been really really impressive this season i mean this season and last he was the beginning of the turnaround right when he came mm -hmm. over in january all of a sudden united uh, make that run and are able to get to third initially like when the season shut down pre-COVID, like I, I, I wasn't sure if they would even make uh, the Champions League because mm -hmm. they were fifth or sixth maybe. Uh, I think Wolves were right there as well. So for them to finish third was really impressive. And yeah, he's, he's a world-class player, obviously. Um, I think he's, you know, obviously much respect to Cristiano Ronaldo and what he's still doing at his age. But I think Bruno is legitimately giving Cristiano a run for uh, best player from Portugal mm -hmm. uh, right now. And uh, I think the, you know, beyond what he does on the pitch, it's the leadership, right? There, there, there's no acceptance of anyone being at a mediocre level, right? Like he'll call out players, he'll push them uh, to play at a certain level. And it works because he's playing at that level and he, so he can demand it from everyone else. There's been, like, I, th I thought a big turning point of the season was when it came out after that Tottenham loss, you know, that 6-1 loss. And Ole took Bruno off at halftime. And they got into a fight because Bruno was saying, we're Manchester United. We can't be, you know, just trying to minimize the damage. You know, we, we have to keep mm -hmm. trying to win every match. So that, that, to me, spoke of the leader he is. And I, I think, you know, if Pogba can get healthy, I think United will look uh, pretty good to close the season. Absolutely. And one yeah. last question. What's happening yeah. at Van de Beek? Uh, Van de Beek, I think, uh, you know, I, I would just give him time. I, mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, in terms of the transition, I would I'd be surprised if Pogba is here next se at United next season. I think, you know, he's going to make a good impression to finish the season to any club that he wants to go to. And move on, uh, and so I would, uh, I if I were Van de Beek, I would just try to stay patient and try to bide that time and see where 
uh, he can fit in best because it's just going to be tough while Pogba is around. But I can see him definitely much, uh, definitely being a part of the future plans once Pogba is gone. All right. So uh, again, Vivek, thank thank you so much for thank for you. joining us. I think that's a the good spot to to end it off. I mean, we got a Raptors game to watch pretty soon, so yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you need to use the washroom first and and get get mentally prepared for it. But. Uh, uh, if, if you can just tell everybody where, where they can find your stuff, if you have any any articles, uh, recent articles or any upcoming articles that, that people can check out. Uh, yeah, you can find my work at CBC Sports. I do uh, some long form stuff there on Canadian Olympians. And uh, obviously, I do a lot of video work for them, including North Courts, which is a Canadian basketball themed show. And besides that, you can find my work at Complex Canada, where I do a bunch of different stuff. You can listen to, we talked about Manchester United. You can listen to the Red Couch Manx podcast, which recaps every Manchester United match. And yeah, besides that, you can follow me on Twitter at Vivek M. Jacob. Again, awesome. thank you very much. And uh, yeah. to all our viewers and listeners, uh, make sure you uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, hit the little bell for notifications whenever we put anything else out. Uh, we're available on all major podcast platforms. So, uh, you know, subscribe to us there and at Box and One Pod on both Twitter and on uh, Instagram. Uh, just leave us any feedback, anything you want to hear uh, or see on upcoming episodes. Uh, make sure you reach out to us. And uh, yeah, we, we appreciate you guys listening and uh, we'll, we'll, See you soon. Actually, uh, one last thing: we we recently recorded uh, an episode on uh, Negro Leagues baseball history, um, and that should be out soon. So just look out for that. That was a, a really great episode with uh, with Raymond Doswell from the uh, Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. So I uh, should have that out in a couple of days as well. All right. Thanks everybody, right. and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks.